afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. It's um, really a privilege to uh, to speak to this this group. It's it's wonderful uh, to 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 know about the prospect of being broadcast nationally on December twenty first in the in the episode on on PBS. But it's it's also really great to uh, to sit face to face with people who are really engaged in this subject. And uh, so I appreciate the invitation to speak this afternoon. Um, oh, here, here, here it comes. Come on in, Teresa. I just started. You know who I am anyway, so yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, um, it's, it's really wonderful also to, to see some of these objects uh, come out of our archives uh, in fact, I had to re-familiarize myself with some of these. It's been years since I've really paid attention to some of these objects. Um, and, uh, and for context, we've got some, some photos um, back there. I'll be referring to some of these uh, during my talk. Hi, Anne. Um, and, and what I'm not going to do is tell you all about the Gamble House, because honestly, it's only 40 minutes drive to the east. and. <laughs> And probably most of you have been there, um, uh, if not all of you. And uh, although uh, Carter confessed that he hadn't been there yet, so that's that's his that's his assignment before he heads north. To uh, anyway, <laughs> just uh, but I but I do have a couple of images. Uh, the one on the screen here is one of my absolute favorites from our new-ish book uh, from 2015. It's a photograph by Alex Vertikoff, uh, who, uh, uh, believe it or not, specializing in in arts and crafts, early 20th century architecture is a thing. And that's what Alex Vertikoff uh, uh, does. And this is a really nice image of, of the staircase looking down from the second floor in, uh, towards the entry hall of the Gamble House, um, showing, as, as we were just talking informally uh, earlier, showing how the greens called out every piece of wood. And they're, you know, they're proud of each individual plug and, uh, uh, and the stair rail, which is carved out of one piece of Burmese teak, um, stepped up like that to recognize the step up of the treads and risers and the staircase itself, and, uh, um, and, and the, the splines. Each block here is carefully called out, uh, and it's all about the wood. It's all about the wood. <laughs> um, uh, just a, um, just to orient you, uh, the, the greens are probably most famous for their architecture designed around uh, um, be between about 1906 and 1911, a relatively short period of time during which they had the privilege and great uh, luck to have clients who were really interested in, in uh, the kind of work that they were doing and, uh, and able to pay for it. Uh, so the, uh, the Gambles of the Procter & Gamble Company of Cincinnati, Ohio, commissioned this winter home uh, from Green & Green in May of 1907, and it was completed in time for them to have Thanksgiving dinner there in 1909. And uh, during that period, the Greens uh, designed uh, the house and a lot of furniture for, for the house, and rugs, and light fixtures, and fireplace tools, and. Uh, um, I, it, was, it was a collaborative project uh, between the Gambles and, and the Greens that uh, went far beyond what we normally think of as, uh, as an architectural commission today. It was a Gesamtkunstwerk, as the Central Europeans called it, that, um, uh, that really created a, a, a complete work of art. Um, Gesamtkunstwerk, Gesamen means together, Kunst, Art, Werk, Work. So it's, it's really, a, you know, it's a together work of art. And that's, uh, that's what you can see. We're incredibly uh, uh, fortunate to have the Gamble House uh, with its original green and green furniture intact, available uh, to the public for touring. And that's thanks to the Gamble family and their gift in 1966 um, to the city of Pasadena. So I'm not going to talk about the Green's architecture today. I'm really, uh, I, I want to talk about their craft. and. Uh, and, you know, what the Greens did for architecture was to sit down at a drafting table and sketch. And so Charles Green would, would create conceptual sketches of, 
of houses that would, would then become more and more sophisticated and, and, and it would be in conversation with the clients. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people who don't think very hard about these things so they will say things like, oh, the Greens built that. Well, they didn't build that house. They, they were, there were contractors and subcontractors involved to do the actual making, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But of course, essential to the, to the process is, is, is the concept and, uh, and the drawings and the faith in your architect that they can think successfully in three dimensions. That's really what, uh, what we're after uh, uh, here is to understand how that, how that works and how bringing the three-dimensional object into, into reality, uh, in, into uh, real form, um, is, is certainly a central concern of the designer, um, but they have to have a lot of faith in their makers too. Um, so there they are, Charles on the left and Henry on, on the right. Uh, Charles was uh, born in 1868 and died in 1957. Um, for context, Frank Lloyd Wright was born the year after. Um, Charles Rennie McIntosh was, was born the year before. Th this was a kind of a, a rich uh, moment for the spawning of <laughs> future architects, apparently. Henry Green was born in 1870 and died in 1954. So they had good long lives. Uh, but their, their, uh, their most um, uh, characteristic ar architecture that we think of as their uh, kind of classic style uh, was produced in a relatively short period of time in, in, uh, in the uh, decade and a half after the turn of the century. Uh, what really, 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 I cannot emphasize this enough, what really sets these two architects apart from most other architects is that they had polytechnic skills that were uh, that were developed at the Manual Training School of Washington University. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright had his Froebel blocks. Um, green and Green had, um, had lathes and, uh, and they had real practical hands-on experience making things. One of the classes they took was in tool making and that'll be an important uh, thing that we'll talk about a little bit later. They actually made tools. Um, so that they could make other things, they could do other things with those with those tools that they made. Um, uh, there's a mallet over here that's uh, got uh, the name Green carved into it in kind of rudimentary uh, letters uh, that looks to me very much like a student project. This this mallet, uh, you can see the the turn marks of the lathe. It's a pretty simple uh, um, object. Um, I mean, it doesn't come with a smoking gun that says. Um, uh, I, I made this for the manual training school, but it looks like the kind of thing that might have been asked of them. Um, and here's, the, uh, here's Charles Green's graduating class. Thank you, Anne, for getting this to me yesterday. Uh, from 1887, um, I love this image. It's, uh, each one of the students, almost every student, has some uh, tool or some thing from, from the school in their hands. Charles is there in the lower right with a sledgehammer. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that says very much about, about, about him at that time or not, um, but, uh, but there's, there's his class. So these are teenage boys, and they were all boys, uh, who were learning um, polytechnic skills, but also getting uh, traditional academic training at the same time. So it was the first, the manual training school was the first of what are sometimes called the hand, heart, and mind schools that um, that flourished then in the second half of the 19th century. Indeed, I went to one of them in San Francisco, uh, the Lick Wilmerding School, which is still, uh, is still calls itself a hand, heart, and mind school. Uh, everyone was required to take shop courses, and you also had traditional academic courses at the same time. Um, so there they are. Uh, there's the mallet and Charles Green's uh, uh, plane <coughs> over here, too, in which he's He's carefully carved his initials CG, uh, and that's in the, in the case over here as well. So this is a guy who uh, is, is comfortable with making things. He's, he's developing a comfort with, uh, with, with producing things. At the same time, he's learning how to um, conceptualize three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional plane, uh, design drawings. And uh, it was a natural for the two brothers, Charles and Henry, to go from the manual training school directly into MIT for their formal architectural training. Um, their father was bent on, 
on the two boys going into architecture and practicing together. Uh, this was a mantra that was apparently drilled into them from a very young age. Charles was given a book for Christmas called The Boys' Book of Building Arts or something like that um, uh, at, 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 a, at a very young age. Uh, and there was just, you know, there was no question about it. At MIT, Charles really chafed at this, uh, at this uh, whole thing. He, he didn't like studying architecture. He wanted to be an artist. He, he took water, he begged his parents to, to let him take watercolor um, um, uh, 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 classes from um, a man named uh, Ross Sterling Turner, who was um, a, a well-known watercolor teacher in Salem, Massachusetts at that time, uh, and, um, and taught at, at, at one of the local art schools. Uh, so uh, this is a typical MIT class. They're all dressed up. I can't, you know, it's sort of odd how much this looks like a laptop computer, but it's <laughs> obviously not. Uh, there's uh, Henry Green there and Charles uh, in the uh, graduating class of March of 1891. They took the two-year uh, course, which was a, a compressed course, which most of the students at MIT took. Very few went on to do the entire four years. If they had, they would have spent at least a semester in Paris um, uh, doing, uh, doing a, 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 um, a studio program there. Uh, but because of their, their training at the Manual Training School in St. Louis, um, they were eligible for the, for the two-year partial course and, um, uh, and, and uh, went on uh, to um, apprentice with a number of, of uh, uh, architects in Boston. They were in Boston for a total of five years. Uh, they lived across the street from Trinity Church. MIT at that time was in Back Bay, Boston, across the other side of Trinity Church. Uh, so this was, their, this was their beat. The Boston Public Library, this great McKim, Mead, and White Beaux-Arts monument, was being built during the time the, the Greens were students there. So they, they would have seen it go up stone by stone between 1888 and 1892. It was exactly the time the Greens were there. Um, now the two buildings face each other across a, uh, Copley Square, if you know Back Bay, Boston, uh, and and uh, this was the the old guard, uh, the, the 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 Henry Hobson Richardson, uh, Anglo Romanesque, uh, uh, load bearing stone, you know, really robust uh, architecture. And then, uh, by contrast, on the other side of the of the square, which was called Art Square, by the way, at that time, because the Museum of Fine Arts was also on on uh, Copley Square. Um, uh, it was this very elegant, uh, classicized um, uh, building here. So a real contrast in really setting up a debate about architecture in Boston at the time, something that the boys would have. Henry Green um, uh, also uh, dabbled in watercolors. And I love to show this to, just to give an idea of how different the two brothers were. This is Henry on the left and uh, the older Charles on, on the right. These two watercolors probably done about the same time uh, when they were in Boston, and uh, both very different takes on on the on the nautical idea. Um, Charles is is much more freewheeling and and you know guns blazing, uh, 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 the sails in in shreds, and Henry's Henry's very composed and very. Um, placid uh, and nicely, nicely composed. Charles can't help himself. He's already got a pencil sketch of some other ship down in the lower left-hand corner uh, going. So he's, you know, really his, his mind was always, always churning. So that tells you a lot about the difference between the two brothers. They ended up being extremely complementary as a result of those differences, in my view. Um, they left Boston in 1893, in the summer of 1893, and stopped in Chicago on the way out to Pasadena to join their parents, who had moved from St. Louis to Pasadena in, uh, the year before. Um, and while they, they were there, of course, in addition to the, the, uh, the, the Beaux-Arts classicist buildings, of, uh, the main buildings of the, of the fair, um, they uh, probably also had an opportunity to see the Japanese pavilion, the Ho'oden, Sadly, we don't have a smoking gun letter saying, oh, and we went to the Japanese pavilion today and we were really impressed by that and uh, we, are, we feel certain that Asia is going to figure, you know, loom large in, 
in, in, our, in the influence on our future architecture, but nothing like that um, I exists. It's all um, just speculation. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, on the other hand, did um, point to the Japanese pavilion at the Chicago Fair as an influence on him. And it was in the air. I mean, everybody was paying attention to Japan and, and Asian design uh, in the late 19th century. It was, it was big. And Boston, where the Greens had spent five years, uh, was the center of Japan's scholarship in America. Uh, all the goods were coming into the port at Salem. And, and the East India Marine Hall was, was there already a center for uh, um, uh, um, uh, ethnographic uh, objects coming from, from the, f the Far East, as it was called. When the Greens started their practice, and I'm not going to show you a lot of architecture, but I, I can never resist showing this thing. It's just hilarious. Um, what, they just wanted to use everything they learned at MIT <laughs> all in the same house. And, <laughs> And it's, you know, I, I call it an honest failure. Uh, it was the first really big house that they did um, for a, uh, a, a socialite family, the Swans. And um, I just, uh, I, I think, you know, there's, there's so much um, uh, scholarly attention here to too many things uh, that, um, uh, that you, can, you can sort of feel that these are two young architects who are really ready to uh, trot out their wisdom. Um, that was tempered uh, before too long. Uh, Charles and Henry both met the ladies that they would marry. Um, uh, Charles um, uh, was married in 18, yeah, sorry, H Henry was married in 1899 and Charles in 1901. And, on, uh, and Charles married an English woman. On their honeymoon, they went to uh, England and Scotland and uh, Italy and France. And it was, uh, it was not shortly after, after William Morris had passed away in 1896, uh, but his business was still very active and, um, and his influence was very strong in, uh, in Britain and elsewhere, and even in America for that matter. Um, uh, so uh, it's hard to imagine that they didn't pay attention to the William Morris effect uh, on architecture. Uh, they went to the Lake District um, uh, which is where Charles's wife was from, and there were two brand new houses by the arts and crafts architect uh, Charles Francis Annesley Voisey uh, along Lake Windermere uh, that um, uh, the Greens, uh, that Charles and his wife surely would have seen um, uh, from the uh, from the boat on Windermere, which they which they took. Um, uh, they went out to to Somerset and Devon in uh, 1901 and uh, to Cornwall. Um, and Charles did this watercolor here. Uh, again, he was really, he really fancied himself more of an artist than an architect even, even then, uh, leaving his brother behind back in Pasadena to take care of the business that was going on. But when they returned, uh, he and his wife, uh, when they returned to Pasadena, they got a commission from a man named James Culbertson. And, uh, and, and this is where you start to see the influence of the English arts and crafts movement in their work. And he, he wrote a, um, what sounds to me like a somewhat defensive letter to Mr. Culbertson, saying, say, to Mr. Culbertson in answer to a question. Um, uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Culbertson, uh, um, uh, I am in thorough sympathy with the William Morris movement. Uh, and he goes on to, to say, in fact, almost everything in your interior is, is designed with, with that in mind. Um, uh, so he's, uh, he's, he's obviously paid some attention to that. They, w they went to the South Kensington Museum, the Victoria and Albert, um, uh, where the Morris and Company Green Dining Room was already installed, and they would have had a, uh, a look at that. Um, the carving, the pithy sayings carved into the mantle there, uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, mottos that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright published in his book, um, uh, The House Beautiful, which was a kind of a uh, fine press publication that Frank Lloyd Wright was involved in in 1890, well, in the late 1890s, I believe. Um, and you can see the interior here, influence uh, of uh, you know, Japanese art goods, um, uh, a Chinese uh, screen over the mantel, 
uh, Indian baskets, all of these things were part and parcel of the, the well-cultured arts and crafts interior. Uh, in about 1903, the Greens started to design furniture for some of their homes, and uh, this is a sketch that Charles Green did of a couple of interiors for a house in Claremont. Um, and uh, and he, he had in his collection from the spring of 1903 a Gustav Stickley brochure uh, uh, with an explanation of the, the structural style of household furniture. And that's probably the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the most uh, obviously American uh, contribution to the arts and crafts movement is this four square chair that, um, that Stickley made uh, so incredibly popular. And then that was expanded to desks and pianos and everything else and bookcases and you know, this very uh, rectilinear um, uh, uh, style. And for a while, the greens were in thrall, but it didn't last very long. They began to stray from, from the straight line pretty quickly. Um, and I, I give uh, part of the credit to, uh, to the influence of Japan really coming to the, to the fore uh, later that year. This is Charles Green's own copy of Japanese homes and their surroundings from, uh, and he's dated it, uh, uh, this is a smoking gun, he's very kindly uh, initialed and dated the book um, uh, December 1st, 1903. The interesting thing about that date is that it's within about uh, two weeks of a design that they did. Um, oh, it, it, it gives us um, uh, lots of illustrations about how buildings are built in Japan, uh, including uh, this um, foundation stone being pounded down and how, how the wooden post sits on the foundation stone. And within a couple of weeks, you start to see that uh, feature turning up in the Green's work, in, uh, in particular in the Bandini house. In fact, he went back retrospectively and erased the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the post sitting directly on the concrete pad and drew in a stone uh, shortly after getting his copy of, of the, um, the Morse book. And here you can see this is another house from 1904, the Cora Hollister house. Uh, and you can see here how prominent the, and, and important those stones are for the, the posts to rest on. Uh, they didn't need to do it, um, but it was a design feature that, that spoke to them uh, right, right, right away. This house, unbelievably, was recently discovered to have been moved to Alberta. Um, it was moved in 1917 and it was documented in a, in a newspaper article in the Los Angeles Times in 1917 that the family that, that had bought this house from the ones who commissioned it, so not the original owners, loved the house so much they couldn't bear the idea of it being torn down because the corner of Cahuenga and, and, uh, and, and um, um, uh, Sunset uh, was already becoming too fancy and too valuable for a single family dwelling like this. So the family took the part of how the house apart piece by piece, loaded it onto four boxcars and took it up to Canada. And part of it is still there. It's just uh, just um, uh, west of Edmonton uh, in, uh, on you know, one of the tracts that just uh, kind of farmland. <laughs> it, uh, it's, uh, you know, you can't make that up. Uh, by 1904 and 1905, they were, they were doing more distinctive furniture, but still kind of rectilinear, like, and uh, this is ash, not oak, but it's similar wood to, to oak, and sort of recalling the, the, uh, uh, the stickly influence. Uh, but they're beginning to go off uh, on, on, a, on, on a different uh, track here, and there are a lot of very um, um, uh, Chinese and Japanesque features to this particular house, the Adelaide Titchener House in, in Long Beach. And, and for it, they did a whole uh, suite of furniture. But the furniture is not well made. It is really shoddy workmanship. Um, and uh, part, part of that is, I, I think the, you know, the Greens knew what they were designing, and they were hoping that they, their makers could rise to the level of their designs. And they were disappointed by the, the people who were doing their furniture at this time. They hadn't yet come across the people who would really um, 
uh, raise the bar for for them and 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 for their makers so that they could really you know challenge each other to design and make at the highest level that was yet to come and those were these two men John and Peter Hall John Hall on the on the left uh, furniture maker and Peter Hall general contractor two brothers so two pairs of brothers John and Peter Hall Charles and Henry Green uh, the Halls were actually Swedish their name was Jonasson and when they came to America, the family changed their name, uh, their, uh, their name to Hall. Um, and, um, and this is their workshop in Pasadena. This is a little bit later than their work, most of their work with the Greens. Uh, but, uh, but these guys uh, began to work with, with Green and Green in 1904. And by 1906, the Greens had identified them as the people who, who could really do the kind of work that they, they needed them to do. And, uh, and just this is the first big suite of furniture that the, the, the Hall Manufacturing Company produced for Green and Green for a house that they designed along the edge of the Arroyo in Pasadena for the Henry Robinson, Henry and Laura Bell Robinson house. It was really Laura Bell's money that, that built the house. And, uh, and they commissioned a, a, a large number of pieces of furniture for the, for the house from Green and Green. Green and Green designed the furniture, turned over the drawings to the Hall to the Hall Manufacturing Company, and they made um, these pieces. These are all on exhibit at the Huntington Library in the permanent Green and Green Gallery. Um, there, the stained glass that the light fixture is adjustable height. Um, it's um, it's of course it's a combination of the wood frame and the leaded art glass, and so there's two different trades working together to produce this really outstanding. Um, light fixture that can be raised and lowered depending on, you know, what kind of effect you want. Um, uh, and the, the, the leading on this is absolutely, uh, it's amazing. It's, it, it, they're, they're tiny pieces of almost like mosaic uh, sized tessellated glass, each one wrapped in copper foil and then leaded. Um, but, um, uh, oh, but that doesn't stop there. It, as you might be able to tell from this photograph, the, the glass um, is sort of slumped uh, vertically. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not uh, sure how else to, uh, to describe it, but um, it curves. It, there's an S curve here in this corner panel. And in fact, in this end, end panel too, uh, that, uh, it, there's an S curve that follows the, um, the shape of the, of the um, of the frame, um, so in other words, the the uh, the, uh, the Hall brothers who were making the wood frame, and Emil Lang and Harry Sturdy, who were the stained glass uh, uh, fab fab fabricators, would have to work very closely together to to make it work. So the frame would be finished first, sent to the Sturdy Lang company, and then they would fit the panels of glass into the uh, into the frame. Um, this deceptively simple looking chair uh, probably drove a couple of uh, makers uh, stark raving mad. Um, these, these, um, so you, you've all seen Frank Lloyd Wright's um, uh, uh, spindle back chairs that have you know, dead square spindles uh, that are completely straight. This is none of that. <laughs> this is really, really uh, uh, everything that that's not. Um, each one of these is a kind of a pinched diamond shape in plan and then uh, morphs into a kind of a spatula towards the top where it fits into the crest rail. Really difficult to do. I mean, you know, today it's done uh, w without batting an eye, uh, but, uh, but to get, you know, spindle one, uh, to, to be the mirror opposite of, of spindle, or the mirror version of spindle five over here, uh, and two uh, mirror version of four is, is no, no small feat. Um, Charles Green was by now um, considering himself to be the artist architect. Uh, he would later write a, a magazine article called Architecture as a Fine Art, and in fact that's our branding motto at the Gamble House, architecture as a fine art. Uh, and it really says what they wanted to say about their work. Uh, they approached it as, as uh, uh, creating art for their, for their clients. Um, in 1912, he made this, uh, this brand, 
uh, and he would burn this into his pieces of furniture. Um, uh, ironically, by that time, most of the pieces of furniture the Greens produced or the halls produced for the Greens had already been made. Uh, so many, most pieces of green and green furniture are not marked. Uh, but the ones that have, have this mark uh, really show that you know, Charles Green is asserting himself as the designer. This, um, it says Sumner Green, he dropped Charles after, uh, after a while and styled himself Sumner, um, his true mark. Uh, so that's burned in, not on the underside of the chair where you know, most self-effacing people would <laughs> put it. No, it's, on, it's clearly visible on the, on the side panel here. Um, and and how, how, did, how did John Hall and his people feel, the ones who were actually making these things, uh, when, when Charles Green came along and started stamping their furniture uh, with, his, with his mark? It was, you know, he was, this is my work of art. This is my piece. Um, so a really interesting uh, a kind of um, uh, perception there, self-perception, uh, different from, from what was going on uh, uh, with other architects for the most part. Um, so the leaded art glass uh, really looms large in their, in their work uh, um, also. And, uh, and, and yet, of course, uh, Emil Lang and Harry Sturdy were the fabricators, the ones who were actually making these pieces. But the Greens were coming up with the ideas uh, that would set the leaded art class apart from other architects' work also, and very, very different from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who did you know, stylized, stylized nature. The Greens, um, I think, were, were um, stylizing in their own way, but but trying to uh, portray a more naturalized uh, um, uh, view of, of nature. But they were also integrating that more uh, directly into the architecture itself. So, uh, for example, the, uh, the tree that's in the front entry doors of the Gamble House in this beautiful triptych and transom uh, series of panels, um, the, the tree's branches go beyond the frame of the glass, don't they? they? They connect with the architecture itself. So it's not a complete scenic uh, representation. It's, it's a middle ground. It's, a, uh, it's that sort of, it's, it's that in your face tree uh, whose um, branches are, are meant to be thought to continue beyond, uh, beyond the canvas of the glass. And also notice that the leading itself, the sheet lead uh, between pieces of glass uh, becomes an important part of the design. It's not merely to connect two pieces of glass, but it, but it shows roots. It, it really it is part of the design. And when you get up close to it, you stand in front of it, you can see the, the bark of the tree is actually um, uh, pushed in as, as a kind of a, a, um, a sculptural detail in the leading itself. Oh, I, I, I just noticed this the other day, and I just thought, of course. Um, the background glass, the field glass, has striations that are horizontal. And of course, that, that's to represent the sky, isn't it? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't, as a designer, you wouldn't dream of, of having those striations go vertically in this, in this context. Uh, but that's the kind of thing where you have to imagine either the architect, the designer, in this case, Charles Green, stood over the glass fabricator and said, now here's how I want you to do the field glass. Um, or they, they found the people who they could really trust to, to just understand those kinds of subtleties um, intuitively. Wood carving was something that um, uh, Charles and Henry could both do, uh, but of course they were too busy during the time they were designing all of these major houses to, to be able to uh, carve themselves. Uh, this is a snapshot that, um, uh, from Charles Green's uh, 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 collection, as, uh, unless I'm mistaken about that. Anne, is that, was that one of Charles Green's snapshots, as far as you know? Mm -hmm. It looks like the same format as some of the others. Also, there's Sidney Gamble, but I don't remember. Sidney or Clarence. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway, it's a snapshot of, of, the, of some of the panels um, stacked up on the rear terrace of the Gamble House. Before the terrace is completed, by the way, it's interesting to note, you, the, the, the brick border is there, but the pavers haven't yet been installed. Uh, but they've got these uh, redwood panels stacked up here. And this one, uh, of course, is one of the panels installed in the house. Um, and it happens to be this one here. Um, so they're, you know, they're really proud of these, of these pieces. And, and I don't know exactly how these came about, uh, but this is the Japanese method of wood carving. And Charles Green had a book uh, uh, published in about 1907 called The Japanese Method of Wood Carving, a small little booklet published by the, uh, by the studio uh, magazine people in, in London. Um, and the Japanese method, as you can probably guess, is uh, to use the natural characteristics of the piece of wood itself to dictate the design, to help suggest a design that's appropriate. Um, so, so the grain of the wood, which is, which is brushed, in this case, uh, California redwood, uh, the wood is, is brushed to accentuate the grain, to draw out the uh, natural characteristics. Um, those characteristics easily turn into an interesting sky with clouds. And, and, um, and the trees uh, are a, kind of a natural thing to carve into a tree uh, because you end up with grain, which is appropriate. Um, What's interesting about this particular piece is that it doesn't attempt to be very glamorous. It doesn't attempt to be pretty. Uh, that's not the point at, at all. There's a stump over here that just stops. And, and there's a kind of a pathetic uh, single branch uh, and a ball of leaves here uh, protruding from it. And this thing looks like it's really distressed. Um, <coughs> um, and if you look at the, the photos over here in the, in the, in the case, there's uh, and this is a, a Charles Green uh, snapshot um, uh, from his collection. <clears throat> There's a really, you know, gnarly looking tree, uh, very seriously stressed and old. And he liked that kind of thing. That was, you know, that was, um, uh, uh, to him, that was much more um, intriguing than a, um, than a, perfect, a perfect tree, I think. Uh, in um, January of 19, uh, 1909, uh, Charles Robert Ashby came to Pasadena. He came to, to the West, uh, and he, um, he went to Los Angeles, Pasadena. He went up north to Stanford, gave a, a lecture there, uh, went up to Seattle, went out to Colorado. He gave 40 lectures in the space of a few weeks um, on the arts and crafts movement. <coughs> and one of the things he did was to um, visit Charles Green, and I don't know if that was something that he'd planned for a long time, or it was more, more or less spur of the moment, uh, but um, uh, in a, at any rate, the two of them got together uh, at first over a lunch, uh, which w uh, was apparently impossible to talk at because of the loud music, and he mentions a, a, a miscellaneous woman with yellow hair who made annoying comments. Uh, Charles Ashby was, was unstinting in his criticism of Americans especially. And so it's particularly meaningful uh, that in his journal he wrote this, I think C. Sumner Green's work beautiful, among the best there is in this country. Like Lloyd Wright, he means Frank Lloyd Wright, he feels the beauty and makes magic out of the horizontal line. But there is in his work more tenderness, more subtlety, more self-effacement than is in Wright's work and it is more refined and has more repose. He, that is Charles Green, took us to his workshops where they were making without exception the best and most characteristic furniture I have seen in this country. There were beautiful cabinets and chairs of walnut and lignum vitae, exquisite doweling and pegging, and in all a supreme feeling for the material, quite up to our best English craftsmanship. <laughs> Spooner, Barnsley, Lutyens, Leatherby, I have not felt so at home in any workshop on this side of the Atlantic, but there we have forgotten the Atlantic, it is the Pacific. Here things were really alive, and arts and crafts, what, the other, what all the others are screaming and hustling about, are here actually being produced by a young architect, this quiet, dreamy, nervous, tenacious little man, <laughs> fighting single-handed until quite recently against tremendous odds. That's 
Ashby from January of 1909. He, uh, he met with Charles Green twice. They, went, they drove around the Arroyo in Charles Green's car. Uh, they saw their, uh, the green and green houses along the Arroyo. By the way, this is Charles Green you know, stepping forward as the, the, uh, the front man for the firm. His, his younger brother Henry is back at the office toiling over <laughs> all the work that was in the, in the office that needed to get done in January of 1909. Um, but this is the walnut and uh, lignum vitae and, and ebony furniture that Ashby is talking about um, because in the shop at that moment in January of 1909 was the Gamble bedroom furniture, which is black walnut. And so these are the pieces he would have seen being produced. Um, this particular piece, the chiffonier, was the, most, the single most expensive object uh, of furniture produced by uh, John Hall, the manu Hall Manufacturing Company. <coughs> for the Gamble House, um, it, it cost um, in labor and materials as much as you could have spent on a small cottage in Pasadena at that time. So these were, uh, and of course it's a one-off work of art. This is, you know, that's, it's, it's just, it's got inlay of semi-precious stones and ebony, and these are little teeny tiny brass pins that secure the ebony uh, uh, outline of a, tsuba shape, uh, similar to a Japanese sword guard that Charles Green had in his collection. Each one of these drawers, these small drawers, is a different size from the next. I mean, there, there are no two drawers alike. It, and so, I mean, they, they're kind of put together with the same methodology, but uh, with all different sizes. So, so the workmen in the Hall Brothers shop, they couldn't just, you know, okay, give me 15 of these drawers. It, there was none of that. It, it, it was, uh, you had to love doing what you were doing to, to do this. And Ashby goes on, I noticed, tis the old story, that the men who were doing the work were old men, some quite old. I talked with one of them, men who still had a traditional feeling for craftsmanship in woods and who had learned their trade before the days of machine development and before the American woodcrafts had become grand rapidized. Sample of the inlay, silver inlay, and vermilion and ebony uh, in this uh, letter box with sterling silver pulls. Um, these are um, pieces in the guest bedroom, the Gamble House. Uh, this is, um, so remember, the, those pieces are being made by skilled professionals, um, and they're working from the, the Green's drawings. Uh, this is one of Charles Green's sketches of, uh, of an inlay design where he's calling out vermil for vermilion, ebony, uh, lignum vitae, gnarled white, knurled white oak where colored, maple different colors, oak, vermilion, ebony. Um, this is, you know, this is a really thoughtful um, combining of materials. Uh, and there's a similar, uh, there, there are a couple of, of drawings in the, in the cabinet over here, one of, of uh, plants uh, that, that give a, a little bit of a, um, a preview of, of the kind of work that had to go into this, which is, which is much more exacting because it has, to, it has to fulfill a very specific need on a very specific piece of furniture. Uh, here's another example of inlay. This is 1912, a drop front desk for Charles M. Pratt. Um, and the inlay detail, I mean, these are art photographs that the Greens commissioned from a man named Leroy, Leroy Hulbert to document their work. So yet another uh, indication of how they uh, understood their, their contribution to art. Um, this is, <coughs> uh, Leroy Hulbert was, uh, you know, billed himself as an art photographer. And these are, you know, very beautiful tonalist. Um, um, uh, are, Anne, are these silver prints? or platinum prints, do you, do you know? Anyway, they're, they're gorgeous, but they're very, um, uh, they're tonalist, so you, you don't get a lot of, uh, as much information as you might like today, or as I might like <laughs> looking at them, but, uh, but you can see just how over the top this inlay is. This is a side panel on this desk over here. Uh, uh, but if you get up close, you can see that there, I don't know, Jim, what, a thousand pieces of inlay in here? Something crazy like that. Um, 
And uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, by this time, by 1912, when this piece was actually produced and shipped up to the client in Ojai, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Greens were indulging themselves um, in all kinds of, of artistic endeavors, painting, um, uh, carving, and, it, they, and their clients could afford it. Even so, there was a 13-page letter that Charles Green wrote to Mr. Pratt lecturing him on, um, on how, uh, really condescendingly, on how a businessman could never understand, really understand art and, and you know, just pay the bill, will you? Uh, <laughs> In brief, that was it. And um, stone carving was something that, that, uh, um, that they um, uh, undertook, at least at the, in the, on the design uh, level. But, but I think also, um, uh, Charles couldn't ask somebody to do uh, stone carving without having tried it himself. That's my impression of all of this, is that they, they were able to stand over the shoulder of the workers uh, the makers, as you know, as much as that might sound like a horrible thing, um, because they they knew from their days from back from their days of the manual training school, they knew how to do some of this stuff, and and so their um, their executors, their um, their uh, their makers could really appreciate the ad the advice and the direction they were getting from their architects uh, much more than than they would have if uh, if that architect didn't know what they were talking about had never picked up the material in their own hands and tried to do the same thing. There's a very nice piece of, of carved stone over here um, that is in a, uh, the shape of a, of a f more or less flattened flower, which reminds me very much of this design right here. Uh, and so, you know, it makes me wonder whether or not that piece wasn't a kind of a dress rehearsal that he was um, uh, working through in his mind. This is the D.L. James house in Carmel Highlands. If you ever get a chance to go there, just drop whatever you're doing and go. Charles Gray moved to Carmel in 1916 and um, <coughs> built this studio uh, with his two sons, Pat and um, Thomas, <coughs> with uh, salvaged brick from a um, hotel that had burned in Pacific Grove. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, one, one of his wood suppliers gave him some teak. Um, this beautiful front door is carved and with pots of, of tomato vines uh, carved deeply in, into, the, in, in, into the teak. And, and this, is, this is Charles having left the architectural profession in Pasadena. He complained to one of his friends that he was prostituting his art in Pasadena. And, and wanted to turn himself to other you know, creative um, pursuits, including writing, which was a really bad idea. His writing is unreadable, in my opinion, but it does give some, some clues as to what he's thinking. Um, uh, but he, um, uh, he, he then could, uh, um, could turn his attention to, to other, other artistic pursuits. But then pretty soon he got the commission for the D.L. James House in Carmel Highlands, and he couldn't resist. Uh, and then he built, uh, built this and laid in pieces of tile, some from, from other, uh, from tile makers uh, outside of California, including um, uh, Mercer tiles from Pennsylvania and, and some others and, and little chips of, of uh, marble that were left over from maybe from the D.L. James House project uh, is, is how it looks and he'd use them artistically in the floor of the entry uh, of his studio and in, in various other places. Um, in 1925, uh, he um, was asked to come back to a house that he and his brother had designed in 1911 for the Fleischacker family in Woodside, south of San Francisco. It's for sale. Um, if anybody wants to buy the house and 75 acres in Woodside. Uh, it's been in the Fleischacker family all these years since 1911, but they're finally selling it. Um, the fourth or fifth generation is just too big. Um, uh, but Charles Green was, um, was you know, by himself in his studio in those days carving. Um, I don't, there's some discussion, <clears throat> discussion about whether or not he was really capable of, of making this um, suite of furniture, but he surely did the carving and the decorative um, 
uh, the decorative embossing on the leather. You see a box over here with leather stamping tools in a cigar box. These are tools that Charles Green made. Um, and you can, I mean, it's just so obvious that these are, these are handmade um, leather stamping tools and they're mounted on the end of a tenpenny nail um, uh, and, and probably brought back to him memories of his, of his um, days at the manual training school. So now we come to the footstool here and, and after we get our chairs up, you must come and take a very close look at this footstool. It hasn't been on exhibit for many years. It's been pulled out of storage. I'm really thrilled that, that we have an opportunity to see it. I'd forgotten how beautiful it was and how pristine it is. Um, but there's a story behind this and I just, I, bear with me, I, I know I'm going a little bit uh, late, but, um, but this is too good to, to not tell you about. Uh, April 11, 1930. Dear Mr. Green, I have been hoping to hear from you about when the stool is to be ready. The work I was doing is ready to send. The work that she's referring to is probably like a needlepoint cushion uh, cover for the, for the footstool. Um, I should like to have the stool ready to give my son on Mother's Day. It's April 11. And I hope it will be convenient for you to have it sent before the 8th of May. Uh, sincerely yours, Mary J. Moore. She's a nice lady in San Jose who had visited Charles Green and Carmel, and uh, she said, well, could you make a footstool for my son? My dear Mr. Green, 10th of June, 1930. <laughs> my dear Mr. Green, I'm looking forward with real pleasure to seeing the stool which you are so kind to attend to the making of. There is no hurry about it, but I thought I had better tell you about how to send it. You know, she's eager to get this thing. Please send me the bill for the stool at your convenience. I'm only too glad to have to pay such a bill. I trust your family are well, always with thanks. And so she's, you know, she's got an idea of what she thinks it might be, um, it might come to uh, in, in money. Um, July 28th, my dear, Mrs. my dear Mrs. Green, now, she's writing to the wife, I just received your kind letter. I, preach very I appreciate very much your husband's kindness doing such a fine piece of work. I leave for Pasadena on Wednesday night. If Mr. Green would rather have the stool brought or sent later when I am at home, that will be all right. Please send the bill now. I wish to pay for it at once. I know it will be, I know it, will be it, that, that is the stool, <clears throat> will be lovely, and my son and I will like it and appreciate it, uh, the work being done by Mr. Green, and I thank him very warmly. So there's information here. She hasn't gotten the thing yet. Uh, she's <laughs> trying to, you know, <laughs> get some, some oomph behind this project and get the darn thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and she thinks maybe by enticing them to send the bill that it'll hurry things along. Very sincerely, Mary J. Moore. December 29th. Oh Dear Mr. Green, I was so sorry you had so much trouble first making that lovely stool and then bringing it here. When I saw you in Carmel, I thought you were to make a very plain but strong stool. I thought it was to be of oak which would suit, suit the furniture in Tom's den, that's her son. I told you it was a piece of his mother's work to be used in his den so that he could enjoy sitting in front of the fire for a smoke. As I said to you, when I saw the beautiful work on it, that it was far too elaborate for the purpose it was to be used for. Then, if the price you mentioned is correct, I was so astonished when you told me. That is prohibitive. I could not pay this. This is, this is I, 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 you know, I can't, I can't imagine how, uh, how nice it will be to pay your bill. I could not pay the amount you said, so I don't know that I can do anything else but send it back. I do hope you'll be able to find some rich person who wishes just such a beautiful stool. I don't know when I was ever so sorry about a misunderstanding. Sincerely yours, Mary J. Moore. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is Charles Green just going at it with great abandon and love for the materials and his craft, and, and he is in heaven. And why rush this thing? Why, why not give Mrs. Moore the absolute best that she could possibly imagine? That was his point of view, to, uh, to create for, for someone this, this wonder, I mean, you know, it, uh, in, in, his, in his mind, he had someone who really appreciated the kind of work that he could do, and he was gonna give it his all, and he did. And there are the leather stamping tools. Um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that many of these would have been used for the Fleischacker chairs and tabletop from 1925. But I think, especially because this, the metal on this one looks a little bit different 
color, a di uh, like a different color, it's a different alloy maybe from the other ones. I think this one was, he made this one specifically for the Mary Moore stool. Uh, it's a tuba shape and you can see it on the, on the, uh, 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 on the leather seat here. So he completely ignored the fact that she was making the nice needlepoint cover for her son to put his feet on so he could have a smoke um, by the fireplace. Um, he ignored that it was supposed to be of oak. He ignored that, you know, um, that it was supposed to be ready for Mother's Day. Um, none of that mattered. And he then, well, here's, oh, there's the tuba shape right there, and you can, you can identify some of these other tools uh, as being used on this um, leather seat top. So he was, he was really, he was convinced that this woman, who was, you know, very effusive in her letters about how much she was looking forward to, blah, 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 uh, that they were on the same wavelength. Dear Mrs. Moore, January 2nd, 1931. Your letter about the stool was received when I was away from home. I too am sorry if there has been a misunderstanding about the stool, but if you will review the matter and recall to mind your letter of April 11th, that was the first one we looked at, I think it'll be clear to you that I have truly tried to please you according to your instructions in that letter. Kindly let me know when you expect to return home and I will come and see you. Till I hear from you, I will let the matter rest. Sincerely yours, C.S. Green. Um, so, you know, they're like, she's over here and he's over here with their understanding about this piece. Meanwhile, this gorgeous thing has come into existence and um, he's obviously presented her with a bill that she thinks is, is a little more than, um, than ought to have been charged. And this is 19, well now 1931, it's the Depression. And um, Yes, she commissioned it uh, after the stock market crash in October of 29. Um, and she probably felt that she was in, in a good position to be able to commission such a piece. Um, well, you know, we, we, we learn um, otherwise. And this is the tension that often exists, of course, between makers and, and, and clients um, who, um, who aren't clear on what the other person is, is really expecting either to do or to get. And, and so, you know, it, you can imagine, this is uh, Charles Green uh, uh, carving a piece uh, later in 1931 after the disappointment of the, of the Mary Moore stool being sent back to him and his beginning to look for a rich person who might like it. He never, he never sold it. He kept it in his collection for the rest of his life. Um, it was one of his children, you know, it was, it was, it was a thing that he, that he had given so much of him, himself to, to create. And so you can sort of imagine the abandon with which he went after this piece of redwood. I, I almost feel sorry for the piece of redwood uh, because these are really deep carves in here. He's really working this thing very, very uh, robustly and, and, and um, you know, he's, now he's doing this for Martin Flavin, who was a successful playwright, had more than one play on Broadway at the same time um, in those days. <coughs> and Charles Green had done a number of, of, um, of um, uh, interior alterations for his home in Carmel Highlands, and, uh, and this is one of the panels that he was, he was doing for him. Uh, so poor Charles Green, you know, he probably could not understand what was going through Mary Moore's mind when, uh, when she wrote that letter protesting. You know, here he'd done his best. He'd created this beautiful thing, um, and, um, and, that, and that was the response he got. Um, so I've spoken mostly this evening about Charles Green and, um, and not about Henry, and, and that does speak in a, in a craft context, speaks to a lot to the relationship that the two of them had. Thankfully for Charles, during his career in Pasadena, creating architecture and furnishings for their, for their clients, he had Henry. Henry was the guy who kept the work flowing, who, who really understood the, uh, the critical path uh, that projects needed to follow uh, to get from start to, to finish. And, um, and those kinds of frustrations, like the one Charles would have later with Mrs. Moore and, other and a lot of other clients, there, there's, there are other series of letters that show the same kind of frustration. Um, a lot of that was mitigated by, by Henry, who was a steady, 
uh, influence and, and really uh, uh, created a, a symbiosis in the firm that made them, along with the Hall brothers, the, uh, the makers of, of the houses and furniture, pretty unbeatable. Thank you very much.